Thank you for joining us today at LifePoint Church. We believe Sundays are an opportunity to know God. For more information, including locations, service times, and small groups, please visit our website at lifepointchurch.tv. Let's jump into the message. What's up, LifePoint Church? How y'all doing today, everybody? Come on now. Aren't you glad you're here? I want to say welcome to all of you. My name is Mike Burnett. My wife, Stephanie, and I get to... Uh, the honor and privilege of serving as pastors here. And uh, our whole team is so thankful for all of you, especially if this is your very first time. I love getting to meet new folks in our church. We wanna say a big welcome to you, LifePoint. Can we just shout the word welcome to all of our first time guests today, everybody? You should notice if they're walking around with a little white bag with the L on the front, that's the cue that they're new. And so you need to invite them to lunch and pay for it. Oh yeah, it was all fun and games till I asked you to be kind. Uh, welcome to all of our new folks today, and uh, welcome to everybody joining us online and at our Austin Peay State University campus. We love you guys, and so thankful. Man, there's, there's a bunch of folks that get up early and drive to Austin Peay to set up our service over there and then run a whole church and then tear it all down. I just want to say in honor of you guys, thank you so much for your leadership and your service to our church. Can we thank our whole dream team, everybody, all of our volunteers who serve at our church? Hey, uh, today's Baptism Sunday, as you have heard from our campus host today, and I want to encourage you, if you've not been water baptized as a follower of Jesus, today is your day for that. Also, at every location, I'm asking our campuses to join us online at Austin Pier here at Rossview Road in our Next Steps class. This is our history, vision, values, our mission as a church. How you get involved is through our Next Steps class. No one serves on teams. No one serves in ministry here without having first gone through that class. And it's a very simple gateway into a small group as well. So I want to encourage everyone at every location to join uh, right away. And then also, if you would help us out on your social media, share the service right now. If you're on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or whatever, you can share the live stream of our service. Also, if you want to tag your church with quotes or things that you like from the message today, go ahead and tag the church, tag your pastor, whatever you want to do. Let's watch and share. And then tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., everybody, we are live streaming our groundbreaking, clearly one side of the room knows, and this side of the room does not. We have our groundbreaking at Tiny Town tomorrow, everybody, 10 a.m. Praise God, very excited. So I'm gonna encourage all of you, we can't park you all there because we don't have a parking lot yet, but um, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm asking everybody, if you would, just put it on your calendar, mark it down, get on our Facebook Live, our website, and look for the streaming options, and then share it with others. We are groundbreaking on our newest campus, 45,000 square feet right behind the f and Bank on Tiny Town Road. And man, how many of you know, to the glory of Jesus, we wanna reach that part of town for eternity, multiple generations, so thank you for that as well. Your generosity is making a difference beyond our local church. This last week, we had a small team up in New York where we have been asked to help with leadership of a church that has really um, gone way down and we get to help revitalize a church, bring it back to health, install a pastor and relaunch there on Long Island. So any of you Long Islanders feel called to go back home and want to help us replant a church, let us know. We'd love to be a part of that. And the pizza there is way, way good. It's really good, everybody. Um, but your generosity helps make a lot of things happen through your church and in your church. And we believe in tithing. We bring our first 10% to God. As a church, we tithe 10% of the income of this church to missions and church planters and other organizations. And we praise God for that. In fact, two weekends ago was church Sun, was launch Sunday uh, for three different church plants that you guys helped support. And let me just tell you, when you tithe, we bring this to the Lord as an act of worship, as an act of thanks for everything that God has done in you and for you. And, and so we bring our first 10% to the Lord and we give offerings beyond that. By the way, you can give in the mail online through our app. I'd encourage all of you to grab our app. Uh, this week, a friend of mine sent me a quote by Anne Frank. She said, no one ever became poor by giving. I just sat with that text for a minute. I thought that was really an interesting sentiment. I mean, we've done a lot of work as a church with homeless and folks that are in difficult positions. And I've, I've never heard anybody said I ended up here because I gave all my money generously to, the, to others. No one ever became poor by giving. It's a powerful thought. The Bible says it in different ways as well. I mean, the Proverbs is loaded with, with how uh, laziness and bad stewardship can produce poverty in us, right? But, but what Anne Frank says is true. No one becomes poor by giving. Jesus said it's better to give things away than to take and receive. Since we're in Proverbs, let me just remind you, Proverbs 3 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with new wine. A lot of times we think, if I give, I won't have enough left. But I'm just telling you, 
A friend of mine used to call it God math. It just doesn't make sense that giving money away is the pathway for God trusting you with more. So I just wanna encourage you, if you're struggling at all with generosity, this is, a, this is a step of trust and confidence in the Lord. As you give, God makes it part of your living a blessed life. And as God blesses you, tithing and giving it becomes a way that we stay in that flow of God's blessing, amen? So thank you for your generosity and thank you for your giving. Hey, well, today we're in week five of our Words of Wisdom series. We've extended it through the month of March and looking at the book of Proverbs, great sayings, from the book of Proverbs that you can build your life upon. We are gonna take this series all the way through the last, second to last Sunday of March, which is Palm Sunday. Then March 31st is Easter Sunday, everybody. Can you believe it? We're ready for Easter at the end of March. In fact, we have these invite cards for you at every location today. We wanna to encourage everybody to get a stack of these invite cards. And we have services, two services on Saturday, and then four, our regular service times on Sunday, and then of course at our Austin P campus, and we'll be online as well. Let me encourage everyone to get a stack of these invite cards today as you leave to invite your friends. It is a great time to invite people to church. In fact, there's a hunger in our culture. I think coming out of COVID, the first year we were nervous, what's gonna happen? But man, churches are filling up, and this is a great opportunity for you to invite your friends to come to Easter service with you. Depending on the service you invite them to, they could be sitting on your lap. Wouldn't that be a fun Easter? Praise the Lord. No. All right. Some of you guys with germ issues, you're like, don't even. Hey, since you brought your Bible, turn with me to Proverbs 29.2. I've titled the message today, How Righteousness Changes the World. How Righteousness Changes the World. Now, we're going to go a little deep today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nerd out with some of you guys. And today's message is going to feel a little, um, maybe a little academic or heavy. But then I'm going to encourage us and challenge us with some steps forward. How many of you think our world needs something different? Anybody think our world needs like hope, love, joy, peace, like Jesus? Anybody at all watch the news, social media, Netflix? Anybody like paying any attention at all to what's happening in our world? It's an interesting text and title for the sermon. I wasn't sure if it would resonate or not, but I'm telling you, our world, and, and honestly, I, I never want to be a doomsday prophet. Like I never think the world we're living in is worse than other periods of time. Like, you know, the first century was pretty rough. Roman occupied Middle East was a bad place to be. And Jesus entered into the, like the worst time of, of, of that society's history. We always are, are living in times of pain, but I'm just gonna tell you something. I'm gonna say with confidence that I believe with all my heart that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely the hope of the world that we live in. The church of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. How many of you think our world needs hope? I mean, think about it. We have chaos in so many areas, crazy inflation, climate issues, major conflicts in multiple nations, increasingly toxic political division in our nation. Some suggest that we are more divided than ever in our nation's history and facing an impending civil war. Social problems in areas of race, gender confusion, education, sexual immoralities, all the way down to families are constantly under attack and falling apart. I'm not trying to say the sky is falling I'm just telling you there are multiple pain points in our world, and our world needs hope. But I think righteousness is what can change the world. I'm going to say some things today that might challenge the way you think, and some of you are going to think um, I'm making some undercurrent statements, maybe officially announcing my candidacy to be the pastor of this church for another week. I just want to say on the front end, let me just say, uh, I appreciate so many careers, jobs, companies, industries in our world, farmers are the heroes that feed our world. Military, police, first responders, these are the heroes who defend and protect and physically care for our world. We need government to govern. We need teachers to teach. We need doctors to dock. And we need people in all sorts of careers. Every industry and organization has its place in the big picture of the human experience. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to hear this and understand this, and this is gonna rattle some of you because you've never thought about this before. The church of Jesus is the only organization on planet earth that God has ordained to preach the gospel, to share good news, to lead people to be fully devoted followers of Christ. Presidents don't, universities don't, uh, grocery stores don't. Only the church is called by God and ordained by God to preach the gospel and to lead people to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. And the church is not pastors and buildings. The church is us. It's made up of people like you and me who have said, yes, I believe Jesus died for my sin and raised from the dead. I wanna follow him with my whole life. I believe his word, I believe what he says. And the church is made up of people who've said yes to Jesus, and watch this, 
and live their life by the leading and filling of the Holy Spirit of God. It's only the church. Now, this is going to offend some of you, but I didn't make this up. This is God's word. Only the church has the Holy Spirit in it. Only Christians have the Spirit of God living on the inside of them. No other faith system, no other religion has God said, I'll place my spirit in them. None. No other religion, no other faith system, faith system has the Spirit of God dwelling on the inside of its participants. Only the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only Christians have the Spirit of God. Some people say, I don't need the church, I'm spiritual. I don't know what spirit you're spiritualizing there. How many of you know there's the Holy Spirit, then there's the devil and all of his angels, there's crazy moon juice spirit. I don't even know what kind of spirit you're talking about. And then there's our spirit, and we think, I'm just spirit-led, my spirit. No, no, no. There's the Holy Spirit, and that's it. And only the church has the Holy Spirit. Not Hinduism, not Buddhism, not Islam. Only the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has the Spirit living on the... Why is that important? Because the Spirit resides in us as Christians, as a result... We are now seen as empowered ambassadors to this world that we live in, the world in chaos, the world in pain. No other faith system has God chosen to dwell in its people. Only Christians have God living on the inside and then God calling us to be ambassadors to the world that needs the God in us to be the God in them. Only Christians have what the Bible call righteousness which can change the world. So what does this have to do with my sermon title, how righteousness changes the world? What am I talking about with the, word, with the Proverbs? I want us to unpack this text. We're gonna stay in it a lot. We're gonna hit it a whole bunch. We're really centered on one verse, Proverbs 29. I actually read it on leap year. Come on, everybody. Proverbs 20, or February 29th. We had a baby born on February 29th from our church, everybody. So in four years, she'll be one. We're holding her to it. She can't drive till she's, what, 38 now or whatever it is, 16 times four. There's good math in here somewhere. <clears throat> Proverbs 29, verse two. Read this slowly with me. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. Let me say it again. When the righteous increase, Let me read it for you another way. When people who are righteousness increase in number, when the influence of the righteous increases, when the power and the control and the leadership of righteous persons grows, then the people rejoice. They get better. Their lives are improved. When the wicked rule, when godless people, when atheists, when people who oppose the word of God, or when people subtly interject flesh and feelings as God. I mean, this is such a unique binary. It's either righteous people or wicked people. And some of you are like, wicked just sounds so harsh. Okay, unrighteous people. When the righteous rule, everyone's lives are better. When the unrighteous rule, everyone's life is in pain. Can anybody identify what I'm talking about in the world we live in at all? Let's just go back even beyond the world we're in today. Let's look over human history. When wicked decisions, when wicked rules, wickedness rules in homes, abusive fathers and mothers, when when sin is leading in our house, are our children better or worse? When the righteous increase, think about this, when population increases with righteous people, more and more people are becoming righteous, more and more people are living for God, are filled with God's spirit. Let me say it this way. As more and more people come to faith in Christ, then the Spirit of God lives in the people of God, then the world around them gets better. Why? Because Christ is at work in us and his Spirit is leading us and his word and his will and his way is directing how we live our lives. Guess what? Human flourishing begins to rise. But when unrighteousness and godlessness and atheism and and selfishness in my flesh and I'm gonna be my best self leads and rules, then people suffer. The world around us will get better as righteousness increases among us. People are blessed and cared for. I'm going to show you in history how this is always true. But think about it. When godly people are leading your family, your family's better. When godly people are running companies, 
All of the employees just like their jobs better. When godly people and righteous people are running schools, students are better for it. When godly people are running a nation, the whole nation is blessed. When godly and Christian people run a city, or a county, or a church, the city and the county and the church are better. Am I, are y'all here? Do y'all even know what a privilege we're living in in Clarksville, Tennessee, and Montgomery County right now? Both our city and county mayor are spirit-led believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're church-attending Christians. Do you know what that means for our whole community? It doesn't mean the whole city's saved. It just means there's a blessing on our city, and when the righteous lead, the people rejoice. Think about during the tornado and all the tragedies that we dealt with in the last couple of years. The church has been in the center of it all. all. Why? Because righteous people are leading. And our whole city gets better for it. You know what they're not doing? Shutting the church out. Hey, separate our church and state. And they're like, no church, please come and help. Help be a part of blessing the people of our city. I could go on and on. When godly people lead our military, lead our nation, lead your platoon, lead in churches, serve on school boards, run political action groups, everyone is blessed when the righteous increase. It's a powerful reality. It's a major reason we should preach the gospel at all times. It's a major reason we should pray for our nation and for our leaders. We should not be praying for our candidates. We should be praying for godly leaders. Some of you are like, oh, he's going to get political. Okay, here's my politics. You ready? I should be president. I've got a campaign manager right there in the middle. I've got fundraising. Anybody? Let's build a building. Let's build a church. It's a powerful reality, a major reason we should preach the gospel at all times. We should pray for our leaders. We should pray for our school boards. We should pray for our teachers. We should pray for parents. And we should participate in elections. Don't just elect your party. Elect godly people. You go, well, you know, who's to know their personal spiritual life? Well, then we vote on issues based on what God's word says. All of a sudden, things like abortion and marriage and and gender confusion and, and the politics over war and finances is not so much a political thing, it's a kingdom thing. And when God is the Lord of his people, then it doesn't matter our political opinions, it matters the opinion of the Lord. People have asked me over the years, Pastor Mike, what do you think about, and then they'll fill in the blank, what do you think about Pride Month? What do you think about gay marriage? What do you think about transgenderism in our schools? What do you think about the, the, the social media TikToks owned by China? What do you think about all these things? <laughs> I've been working on my... Trump impression is getting good. Close, close. I'm going to use it. Anyway, we're getting there. <laughs> I got to do all my impressions. I got, I got George Bush hat. Anyway, we'll get there. So anyway, China, um, people ask my opinion. They go, what do you think about it? And I go, who cares what I think? And they'll say, well, you're a leader. You're a pastor. You're a, a community leader. Your opinion matters. I said, no, I'm a man under the authority of God and his word and his kingdom. And I said, I may have opinions, but his word rules and his word reigns in my life. So what do I think about marriage? I think what God thinks about marriage. What do I think about sexuality? I think what God says about sexuality. But I have a friend who, well, I have a God who. I don't know what to tell you. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. Why? Because God's kingdom is reigning, not my political opinions and not my upbringing and not my persuasions. It's what God wants. <laughs> you know, it's been quite a year. <laughs> Some of y'all have been waiting, like, please do it. I'm going to preach this sermon bigly. It's going to be really big. Huge sermon. Anyway. <laughs> I, can't get, I can't get President Biden figured out. I, I had Obama for a while. It was like, oh, okay. Oh, oh. Um, but I just, it kind of comes and goes. It's in waves. My Hillary is killer. Um, <laughs> listen, this is why... This is why we pray for our leaders. This is why we are in small groups. This is why we want to be accountable. Because listen, as righteousness increases, our city and our county, our families, our home, from the White House to your house gets better. I have a love for our nation. I have a love for America. But I'm really convinced that the church is the hope of our nation. Now, this past week, I had the opportunity to preach the funeral of a church member of ours, CW3 Dwyer, who died in an accident in combat, and I preached his funeral at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. First time there, it was amazing. Interestingly, the center point of the, of the campus and the highest point of the campus is the chapel. <clears throat> that's, 
thousand seat chapel, by the way, in the Gothic style. But at the old cadets chapel, I got to go into the old cadets chapel and it's this building and it, um, it was actually one of the first buildings on the West Point campus. And this particular facility is absolutely stunning. I mean, you talk about a time we're going back in town. All the plaques on the sides of the wall are, are major generals. George Washington's plaque is here from his burial uh, at, as part of what he was buried off another location, but he started, you know, West Point. Anyway, Henry Knox. I mean, there's so many other great leaders of our day. But at the center of the chapel, interestingly, is this mural above the pulpit. If you zoom in there, it says, righteousness exalts a nation. By the way, they were doing a Proverbs series when they did this painting, it's Proverbs 14. <laughs> righteousness exalts a nation. In other words, godliness, righteousness, makes the nation better, improves and increases the nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. Just evaluate that binary concept. Godliness is good, sinfulness is bad. Does that seem like the biggest no does statement in the world? Remember when, when Moses said in Exodus chapter 30, I lay before you your choices, life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life so that you and your families will live. Well, this is something God's been saying over and over again. Righteousness exalts a nation, but a sin is a reproach to any people. Psalm 33 says it this way. Blessed, favored, rejoicing is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. I've been really moved by this two-line proverb this week. I really believe it's a text we should pray over for our nation especially as we head into election season. I want you to hear something, and some of you are gonna get really upset, and I don't care. I'm gonna say it anyway, because I love you, and you need to think this way. The right candidate will not save America. Jesus will save Americans, and then saved Americans will change America. Can I say that one more time? The right candidate will not save America. 250 years of this experiment called American history have proven that no candidate in the White House, the governor's mansion, no candidate in politics because God didn't ordain a nation to be saved by its political leaders. God's ordained Jesus to save Americans and saved Americans will change America. Listen, I wanna say it like this. I don't say we build a Christian nation. I'm saying Christians should lead the nation we're building. Because when righteousness, when the righteous increase, all the people rejoice. That's actually the big idea I want you to come away with. We need more people to follow Jesus. We need more people to love Jesus and to be found righteous in Christ for our schools and our homes, our country, and for our nation to improve. Let me spend the rest of our time just talking through three different thoughts that I have for us. First of all, we need to define some terminology. What does it mean to be righteous? Right away, I realize there's some clarifying definitions that are needed to make sense of this message. Again, the text, Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous increase. And this is not saying when righteous behaviors get bigger or increase. It's when the righteous, persons who are righteous, increase. There's more of us, right? Then the, the people rejoice. This is an example of a two-line proverb that's written in a way that the two parts of this proverb are meant to complement each other. And here's how they complement. The first part is a statement of truth, and the second part is an equal statement of truth, but the opposite of the first statement. Does that make sense? So the good news of the passage is in the first statement. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. We talked about it. It's good for the country, for the state, for the city, for your neighborhood, for your house, for your kid's school. It's better for people when righteous people are increasing. Then the bad news of this passage is when the wicked rule, a nation or a state, a country, a city, your job, your Starbucks you work in, when, when wickedness rules or leads, then people suffer. Now, without naming any names, has anyone ever known this to be true? I mean, think of Western history. Think of the rise of Hitler in Germany. When wickedness rules, everyone feels the pain. I mean, that's one of the most duh examples I could give. But it happens in our home. It happens in our neighborhoods. It happens in our schools. And it really is a binary. There's righteousness and unrighteousness. And when unrighteousness is ruling, we all suffer. It's pain. So how do we make our nation better? How do we make our city better? How do we make our home better? We increase righteousness. We increase rightness with God. We increase the word of God in our homes. We Listen, we preach the gospel. We see people saved. When I started this sermon, I said, I believe with all my heart, the church of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. I, man, listen, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater on American politics or any of that stuff. I think every nation needs the church to be fully alive. 
If we increase righteousness, our nation will improve. If we increase sin, godlessness, atheism, separation from God, then people suffer. Think about in America right now, because I'm only in this country. I don't live in other nations. Think of all the cities that are on fire right now, right? And we have a way of saying what political party that state is a part of and what kind of politicians lead the, the cities. But let's not make it political. Let's make it righteousness and unrighteousness. Think about the cities on fire. Is it because righteousness is ever increasing? And that's why crime and homelessness and drug addiction and chaos is on the rise because the church is exploding? Or is it because churches are being sidelined, shut down, losing their voice because of a lack of righteousness and sin and selfishness? Parts of our world are known as places of pain, not just in major cities. It happens in homes that many of you live in. You have to decide in this message today, do I want righteousness to increase in my house? Or am I gonna keep righteousness at bay and let sin and the flesh and tempers lead our house? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? What does it mean to be righteous? I'm not trying to be political here. I'm challenging us as a pastor. We know what it means to be wicked, ungodly, selfish, demonic, tearing down civilizations, but what does it mean to be righteous? Now, righteousness is an interesting word to define. It's a word we use a lot of times without understanding its definition. At the root of the word righteous is the word right. And many of us have this kind of religious church definition of righteousness that if I do right, I'm righteous. If I behave right, I'm righteous. I want all of you to hear me when I say this. You can have all the right behaviors without righteousness. The Pharisees proved that to us. They constantly acted right, but they weren't righteous. Well, what's the difference? Righteousness is not keeping all the rules. Righteousness is not self-imposed legalism. Righteousness is not you being better than someone else. Righteousness is not some set of standards that make you better than others. It's not based on merits, moral behaviors. You can't purchase righteousness and you can't earn righteousness. Righteousness is not in you because you attend the right church or you have good giving records. Righteousness is not works-based goodness or acting in a way that's based on your inherent morality or what family you grew up in. Righteousness is not about us. Righteousness is the way God sees you. Righteousness is your posture before God in this world based on the view of God for your life. Righteousness, watch this, is your rightness with God because you are right under God in Christ. Righteousness is something that God does in you in the believer. How we live, how we act, how we believe, and how we behave is the result of a righteousness that God himself has placed on you, like clothing your children. How many of you know if you take your kids out of the house with them getting dressed at one years old, you're taking naked kids out? But how many parents are good enough to know I gotta clothe my child before I present them to the world? In the same way, when you say yes to Jesus, God, the Bible literally says, clothes you with his righteousness. Not your righteousness, not your good behavior, it's his righteousness. And now righteousness becomes a standing with God. I'm righteous in God, under God, because of God. And the Lord looks at you and me now because of faith in Jesus, not as sinners, but as saints. We're not far enemies of God. We're sons and daughters of God. We're not trying to pull up our bootstraps and behave well. We have righteousness placed on us because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness is the way God sees you. Some people say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm just a sinner, sinner, sinner saved by grace. And I get that theologically. Do I sin? Yes. But that's not how God sees you. When you're not a believer, the Bible calls you an enemy of God. Did you know that? I don't care how good of a person you are, how right your behaviors are, how much you wear your seatbelt and obey the speed limit. If you don't say yes to Jesus Christ, and if you're part of any other faith system that doesn't include Jesus Christ, the Bible calls you an enemy of God. And so, yes, you're a sinner. You're far from God. You're an enemy of God. But when we say yes to Jesus Christ, when we believe that he is God, the son who died on a cross for our sin, raised from the dead and lives at the right, sits at the right hand of the father. And by faith, we accept his finished work of, cro of the cross for our sins, for our debt payment, that he gives us eternal afterlife and eternal living. When we say yes to Jesus, watch this, God no longer sees you as an enemy. He sees you as family. 
And, and the Bible says he places his righteousness upon you. In fact, the theological term is we have righteousness imputed. Everybody say imputed. There's a grad school word for all of you. Imputed means assigned. I want you to think in your military career when you were assigned a new rank, when you were assigned an MOS outside of yourself. You go, I didn't know I was ready for this promotion. I didn't know I was ready for this. You and your job, you got a promotion to, to go from, from being a, a teacher to a department head of a, of, a, of a department. You've been promoted. There's assignment placed on you. And what God does for, for us is when we say yes to the Lord Jesus, we have righteousness imputed or assigned to us, placed in us by God because we've accepted Jesus as our Lord. And it's accepted by grace through our faith. Let me show you in the scripture, Philippians 3, verse 9. This is the text where Paul, I preached it last fall in the Philippians series, where Paul gave his pedigree, and he said, everything I've done, I count it as rubbish. Y'all remember the sermon I preached on Scubalon? Google that one. Paul says, everything in my pedigree I count as rubbish, Scubalon, a pile of dung. And then he goes on to say, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not in my works, found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, watch this, the righteousness from God. How many of you know it's great to have righteousness from God that depends on faith? So how do we get God's righteousness? By faith in Jesus. Say it with me. How do we get righteousness? By faith in Jesus. So here's how you got to see it. Righteousness is God's stamp on your life. It's his character. It's his nature. One of the names of God in the Old Testament, he is Jehovah Tzidkenu, the God who makes us and calls us righteous because of him. And it's because of our faith in Jesus. I'm getting into the weeds here on the mechanics of this theology for a reason. Because of his righteousness, we now have a transformed nature. We have a transformed character. We have a transformed conscience. We have a transformed way of thinking. That's how I can say it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God thinks. We're different because we've accepted Christ and our faith in him, he makes us righteous. Watch this, chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the same apostle Paul writes it this way. Therefore, because God has saved us, we have been given a new identity. We're, Christ, we're, we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. He says, therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. That is, we are the ones making appeals of God for other people, making his appeal through us. And Paul pauses here and he says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now watch what Paul says. For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to become sin for who, who knew no sin. Like Jesus never sinned. If anybody was right and right behaved, it was Jesus. But for our sake, the Father made the Son to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Notice the previous text says we have a righteousness from God, but now we receive the righteousness of God. The very same righteousness that God lives with, we can receive by faith in Jesus, which guess what that does? It changes how you think, live, behave, act. It kind of reminds me of Jesus' statement in the word for our church, Luke 6, when he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not live, act, and do like I say? How many of you know when God puts his righteousness upon you, it changes you? Are y'all hearing me today, everybody? This is why I say the church is the hope of the world. This is why I say the church needs to grow. This is why I pray for every pastor in this community to have churches with people sitting in lobbies. If you've accepted Christ, then God made you and me ambassadors for Christ, and he's called us and made us to be the righteousness of God. Listen, we didn't earn righteousness. Jesus earned it. We didn't pay for righteousness. Jesus paid for it. And we get to live with his righteousness forever, which then shapes everything about our lives. And when we're living with increased righteousness, everybody else's lives improve too. Go back to the proverb. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice how we live, how we lead our homes, our jobs, our cities, our nation. Righteous people have God's righteousness, which then increases righteousness in a civilization, and the people rejoice. I'm telling you, people give their, when people give their lives fully to Jesus, cities change. Think about it. Dads, men, I want to tell you something. When you say yes to Christ, your family lineage is going to be different. 
Statistically, they say, when a man submits to Christ, the whole family comes to Christ and follows the Lord. There's something about when righteousness increases, the nations, the people, the families increase. This is why we plant new churches, start new campuses, have small groups, grow in discipleship, because we wanna see righteousness increase. Am I making any sense? I have my smiley face glasses on, everybody. Well, think about it this way. Our world's better when righteousness is on the rise. And remember that proverb, the opposite of that is true too. When wickedness is on the rise, our world's in pain. Some of us, we shake our heads at the things we see on the news and the things we're witnessing, and we go, what kind of these people bust in hell wide open? It should grieve us to go. Here, here's a statement that I use often when I watch crazy on the, in our world. I go, man, our world needs Jesus. Man, our world needs Jesus. And I pray for the church to come alive. Pray for the church to be emboldened as ambassadors of this gospel. Some people are like, I wish Jesus would come to America and just show up and wipe the whole place off. And God goes, yeah, I showed up and I'm sending you because you're my ambassadors now. So don't complain about our crazy world if you won't get out and do anything about it. Our world's better when righteous people rise up. Think about it. If more of us are living under the righteousness of God, if more people are saying yes to Christ and not to worldliness and sin, if more parents are leading their homes with Jesus as the center and married couples are leaving with Christ and leading with Christ in the middle, if more and more people would hear the gospel, our world would improve. The solution to our world is not greater policies and politics. It's more Christ. The heart of God for humanity is to live under the lordship of Jesus. I'm a firm believer as an Arminian that God's desires that every human being on the planet give their life to Jesus. The Bible said it's not his will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance to conform to his will, to live as Christ taught, his kingdom come, his will be done. And the Bible calling us his ambassadors, we are to make an appeal for God's kingdom. So church, do we actually believe that life in God's kingdom and God's reign is better than life apart from it? And if we do believe that, then we should follow the teachings of Jesus. Matthew chapter four shows us Jesus constantly was proclaiming the good news of life in the kingdom of God. We think the right boss or teacher will make life better, but I'm telling you, Jesus will make life better. I'm telling you, if we will win more people to Christ, if we'll invite more people to church, if we'll put more people in our small groups and tell people the truth of the gospel, then God will change the hearts of people. Ezekiel says it like this, he will remove, for Christians only, he'll remove a heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. There's a famous quote by A.W. Tozer, and he says, a scared world needs a fearless church. I love that quote. My daughter uh, made a painting for me one year for my birthday of that. I like this one. A messed up world needs a righteous church. A messed up world needs a righteous church. They don't need a church just shaking their heads, wagging their finger, judging everybody. Well, here we go again. They're going to bust hell wide open. God, to hell with them. Damn them all to hell. Do you believe the gospel at all? How dare we take on that attitude? How dare we? Because Jesus, the son of the living God, moved with compassion, entered into the messiest place in human history. He said, I've come not, to, not for the well, but for the sick. We have to be moved for righteousness to increase. If you study church history, if you study Western history at all, the church has always been a major part of social lift. It's always been the church on the cutting edge of healthy families, healthy civilizations. It was pastors who led the charge to stop transatlantic slavery in Europe. It was always the church with healthy civilizations, caring for the poor and suffering. Did you know governments never do a great job of caring for the poor and suffering? It's always the church. They're at the leading edge of arts and humanities. Think of any classical music, classic artists from the, the history of the world, the ones that shaped the world's art perspective. They're all church artisans. All the major universities in America were established in partnership with the church, many of them serving as divinity school, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, et cetera. God designed the church to be a blessing to culture, not just in preaching the gospel, but in education, healthcare, philosophy, music. Why? Because when righteousness increases and we're leading in all these endeavors, everyone else gets better. How many of you want a doctor that loves Jesus? That'll pray for you. How many of you want a lawyer who's ethical and integrous under Christ? How many of you want politicians and pastors who love the Lord that improve your life because Jesus is the Lord of that interaction? Right, everybody? Remember Proverbs 29, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. So let me challenge this as we close out our time together. Are y'all get anything out of this? I hope so. I hope it's encouraging. It's just a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. Sometimes we get so in our human brain 
get so binary on our politics. How about we get real, like, firm on our godliness and our kingdom principles and our ways of thinking? So what do we do with a text like this? I think we pursue righteousness in our world. Like, we go after it. We pursue it. We chase it down. We long for it. We ask God for more of it. I think it's an active pursuit that the church must desire. Listen, God's not going to bypass the church and go, you know what, we'll just have uh, universities teach on this. God's not going to bypass the church and go, you know what, we'll just get politicians to talk about this. God's not going to bypass the church and go, we're going to have grocery store managers be the beacons of this story. It's the church. It's the church. It's our responsibility. Do we have a heart and passion for people in the world to hear the gospel, to, to be saved, to, to, to give their lives to Christ? Because when people get saved, righteousness increases. So I want to ask you, church, to take a few steps. The first step is simply to pray. Pray for revival. Pray that churches, here's what I, here's how I want you to pray. I want you to pray, write this down. Pray that churches explode with the gospel. I think judgment starts in the house of God. I think churches have to be on the front edge of saying, God, use us, revive us. Make your, make your righteousness through us. So pray for churches and pray for churches to be so full and overflowing that they have to build more campuses, have to start new churches and pray for a holy fire in the body of Christ for people to be saved from their sin, to radically be transformed in their hearts and minds, to bring revival to every community, every city, every nation on the planet. I want every country on, in America. You know how I think about Vladimir Putin? This is God's honest truth. There, are, there have been many times where I'm watching the news about President Putin, the president of Ukraine, and I stop and I pray for their salvation. I literally have prayed for the president of Iran. I've prayed for the, uh, the, the leaders in the Middle East. I pray for their salvation. The greatest thing we could do is see those people turn to Jesus. So we have to start in prayer. Ephesians 3.10 says, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Pray for politicians. Pray for celebrities. I, I literally pray for celebrities. If you think Netflix and Disney is crazy for your kids, pray for those industries that God would wreck them in the power of Jesus. And by the way, pray for your own life and let it start with repentance. Second, preach the gospel. In Clarksville, you know, it's kind of an old school country town in a lot of regards. And I love it when people introduce me to their friends in town, but they always introduce me, this is my preacher. I go, I do more than that. And I go, well, he's a preacher too. We're all preachers. We're actually all called to preach the gospel, not just your pastor. All of us are called to preach the gospel. So I'm asking every one of you, if you wanna see our communities change, if you wanna see your homes change, if you wanna see our nation change, use the platform God's given you to preach the gospel. Tell people you, you know that don't know Jesus. Tell them here's the simple gospel. God loves you so much. He gave his life on a cross for your sin. He has a plan and a purpose for you and he's asking you to invite him to live inside of you by his Holy Spirit and God can change your life forever. Be willing to offend people into heaven. Don't be scared of your boss or separation of church and state. Don't be scared of this stuff. Preach the word of God with boldness. Trust God with your job. Come on, somebody. Share the gospel with people. When righteousness increases, people rejoice. If you want a better company to work in, pray for your leaders to get saved. The only way for people to become righteous and get saved is to hear the gospel. Romans 10 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how will they call on him if they've never believed in him? Well, how will they believe in him if they've never heard of him? How will they hear about him? Somebody doesn't preach to them. How will anyone preach unless they're sent? Church, look at me. In the name of Jesus Christ, your pastor, I'm standing, excuse me, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, I, your pastor, I'm sending you out to preach to this world. You got to know what to say. God will help you. Say what you know. If you got nothing else to say, you've never even read a scripture of your Bible, just say, hey, you should come to church with me Sunday. Tell people how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Finally, promote God's kingdom. So we're going to pray preach the word and we're going to promote God's kingdom. How many of you know his ways are higher than our ways? Please stop getting caught up in cultural craziness. Please stop getting caught up in political uh, opinions. Like, love our nation, pray for the president, pray for our nation, pray for governors, but promote the kingdom of God. Promote God's word, promote God's will, promote God's ways where God is king and we are not. And when we promote his kingdom, we promote his ways, it's attractive, it's inviting, it's all-encompassing, and all of a sudden, we're not promoting craziness or personal biases and cultural trends. We're promoting God's reign and rule. And watch this. And righteousness will rise. And the people will rejoice. I'm asking you, church, to believe the gospel is true. Pray for the lost and for people to give their lives to Jesus. I'm asking you to preach the word with boldness. And I'm asking you to promote God's kingdom overall. 
Because when, when the righteous increase, people rejoice. Here's what I also think. If we won't take this mandate as the church, then don't be surprised when wickedness increases. It's on us. We are Christ's ambassadors. We are the ones called by God. And look, look, look here. We're the ones with the Holy Spirit in us that helps us do it. Y'all hear me, everybody? Come on, let me pray for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. Thank you for the truth of your gospel. Thank you, Lord, for this invitation to preach the gospel, to promote the kingdom of God, to pray bold prayers for revival in our nation, in our cities, in our families, from the White House to our house. God, we thank you in Jesus' name that we can pray with confidence. Your word said, if my people called by my name would pray, seek my face, turn from their sin, that God, you will hear and heal our land. We pray for a mighty move of God through our military, through our government, through our cities, through our school boards, through our social media pages, through our families. We pray for revival in the church. In Jesus' name, God, let it start in us. Come on, church, open your hands to the Lord right now. Say, Lord, let it start in me. Let it begin in me. Revive me, oh God. Lord, we repent of our sin. We repent of trying to have it our way and go our own way. Lord, we repent of living outside of your kingdom, trying to live in both kingdoms, in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. God, we repent of that. And we ask in Jesus' name for a full move of the Spirit in each one of our lives. Because when righteousness increases, people rejoice. I want to ask as you're sitting, eyes are closed around the room. If you'd say, Pastor Mike, listen, righteousness is not part of my life because I've not surrendered my whole life to Jesus. Maybe you've never made a commitment to give your life to the Lord. To really go all in with Christ. You do not have the Holy Spirit in you until you say yes to Jesus Christ. I want to ask if that's you. You don't have to move. Just wave at me so I know I'm praying with somebody in the room. You say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Come on, wave your hand at me right now. Thank you, Lord. Hands moving in the room. Anybody else? Now, for the rest of you, and you'd say, Pastor, I know that I got to get some realignments done today. And I need to go all in with the kingdom of God and the word of God and Jesus is Lord of all. And if that's you and you say, Pastor, come on, pray with me that I go up hard and all in with Jesus and his kingdom, would you wave your hand at me as well? Come on, everybody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, pray this with me. Say, God, I believe in you. I believe in Jesus Christ, the son of the living God who died on a cross for my sin, raised from the dead to give me new life. I receive it by faith. I ask for your forgiveness. I receive your salvation and say, God, I'm all yours. I'm all in. I repent of my sin, of living in two kingdoms, and I will be Christ's ambassador to this world. Use me, Lord, in any way to see the righteous We're so increase happy that you in us Jesus' today. name. Say, God, we I'm all yours. Lord, revive this church, revive our message. families, revive our nation, like revive our city. Thank you, Lord God, that lives will be better generosity. when the gospel is preached, churches grow, lives are changed in Jesus' name. We love you, Lord. God be the glory. Amen and amen.